Thersites the Historian here. Today I would like to talk about the Varangian Guard, the elite unit of the Byzantine Empire. These were men who were recruited from places like Scandinavia and Britain to serve as the Byzantine Emperor's elite unit. Now, during the course of this video, I'd like to lay out the context of the world which produced the Varangian Guard. I'd like to look at um, the Varangian Guardsmen as soldiers. I'd like to talk about their roles. And I would also like to talk about the impact that the Varangian Guard had upon Byzantine history as a whole. So without any further ado, let's dig in. Just to give you a sense of how it is that such a large number of Norsemen were able to make their way to the Byzantine Empire in Southeast Europe, I would like to show you this map. If you notice, all of the Varangians and Vikings originated in Scandinavia, so the countries of Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and they spread out from there. Their favorite method of spreading themselves was via Europe's navigable rivers. And by that means, they were able to sail through Russia all the way to the Black Sea, where they encountered the Byzantines. And as we'll talk about in greater depth momentarily, the Varangians are simply those Vikings who sailed east and then sold themselves into service for the Byzantine Empire. If we want to better understand the Varangian Guard and their significance, we first need to look at the context which produced the Varangians, and that context is the Viking Age. From 800 to 1300, there was the medieval warm period in northern Europe. What this did was it vastly improved agricultural conditions in Scandinavia, which led to population expansion. Now, combined with the warrior culture that had taken shape in Scandinavia, this meant that many um, Scandinavians would leave their countries and become Vikings. The internal politics were such in Scandinavia that a defeated claimant to a throne or a younger brother who was discontent with his lot would take his followers up in long ships and simply depart, going to make his fortune somewhere else. The key tool to the Viking Age, which enabled both the Vikings who raided um, Ireland and the Vikings who settled in Iceland and also the Varangians who sailed through Russia to Byzantium. The key piece of technology during this period was the longship pictured on your screen. The longship was something which could sail easily in both rivers but also on the open ocean because it was low to the water and very stable. And the reason why the Vikings could have only done what they did in Europe and probably not really anywhere else in the world is because Europe's rivers tend to be easily navigable compared to some of the rivers in places like say China or North America. Now Vikings were not just pure warriors and pure raiders basically they were groups of men who were both warriors and traders and their decision-making process was based on the perceived strength of the people they were encountering. So, for instance, if they realized that they had come upon a monastery which was defenseless, they became raiders. They would take up their weapons and they would take what they wanted. However, if the people who they encountered had fortifications and were clearly able to defend themselves, then the Vikings would adopt a more diplomatic approach and they would probably just trade things with them. This was the general approach that the Vikings had in both the West and the East. Now, because they are interested in trade and a lot, they have a lot of aristocrats who are very ambitious and want a great career for themselves, we also see that Vikings try to set up colonies, kingdoms, and other polities wherever they go. And that applied both in Russia and in places like Britain, if you'll recall the last map. While well, the Scandinavians who went west became known as Vikings, the men who went east became known as Varangians. The word Varangian seems to have meant something like companion in the Nordic tongue. And so that obviously must have referred to their status as companions within a war band or something along those lines. Now, whereas a lot of the men who went west tended to come from Denmark and Norway, the Varangians mostly tended to be from Sweden, although that was not a hard and fast dichotomy by any stretch of the imagination. 
unlike in the West where they ran into established kingdoms and struggled to carve out new fiefdoms for themselves, in the East there wasn't a lot of state building that had gone on before the arrival of the Varangians. So without organized opposition, the Varangians were very successful at setting up trade centers and cities along the navigable rivers of Russia. These cities included such famous places as Novgorod and Kiev. And for the most part, the Varangians are considered to be the founders of the Russian state, or what would later become the Russian state. When they originally arrived in Russia, they were seeking fame and fortune. They wanted to make a name for themselves the way that a lot of really famous Vikings like Eric the Red would make a name for himself. And because they wanted to make a lot of money, they were also attracted to go to Byzantium. Byzantium was the richest power of its day, or at least one of them. And they, f they knew that they had warrior skills to sell, and Byzantium had plenty of wars it was trying to fight against the Bulgars and the Arabs, so it was a perfect fit for this warlike people. Now, for the most part, for its early history, the Varangian Guard was composed primarily of Scandinavians coming via Russia, However, after the Norman conquest of England, which ironically was at the hands of former Vikings who had settled in Normandy, a lot of English and Scottish men were exiles from their own country where they were no longer part of the ruling class. And since they had a very similar fighting technique to the Varangians, they went in large numbers to Byzantium to serve as Varangian guardsmen. When people think of Vikings, they tend to have a very fixed image of men who wore furs and then carried large battle axes and wore horned helmets. However, that's not quite accurate, as we'll discuss. Now, um, unlike Viking warbands or Varangian warbands in Russia, when Varangians would enter the service of the Byzantine Empire, they would be expected to adhere to guidelines and regulations about their equipment and dress. And even in an organized army like the Byzantine army, we see that there's a lot of evolution over the centuries of arms and armor. So if you were able to piece together a Varangian um, panoply from say the year 1050, you wouldn't necessarily have looked exactly the same by the time you get to say 1300 there were changes in the ways that helmets were made and the way that chain mail was constructed and things like that. But I'm not an expert on arms and armor, and if you wanted to learn more about that, there are a lot of books by publishers like Osprey that you should probably check out. This is just sort of a brief overview. Now, um, the horned helmet was a ceremonial thing. It was never used by any warrior ever in battle. That's one of the biggest myths about the Vikings and the biggest misconceptions. I mean, I guess it worked out for the Minnesota Vikings. They got to use it as their symbol. However, um, I guess it's just fitting that their team tends to suck since, you know, the horned helmet is not actually a plausible piece of war equipment. Now, um, the battle axe was the characteristic weapon of the Varangian Guardsmen. However, it was probably fairly rare in terms of its usage, and it might have been for the men guarding the palaces mostly. The reason why the battle axe is a bit impractical is because the amount of upper body strength one would need to wield it effectively is something that most men simply don't have. So it was a thing and there would have been warriors who would have been able and willing to wield it. However, the average person in a warband just wouldn't be strong, strong enough or large enough, especially during this period when a lot of people are quite a bit smaller than their modern counterparts. Now, interestingly enough, we do have an Armenian source which was writing around the year 1000, and they talk about Basil II's Varangian Guard unit, and he, this source describes the Varangian Guardsmen as 6,000 men who were armed with spears and shields, kind of like more traditional infantry. In addition, we also know that when they were at court, they didn't wear military uniforms. They had civilian dress that would accompany their battle axes. So the actual way that they looked would probably be different than what we're expecting and even the uh, drawings that I found and posted on this slide are probably not quite accurate. 
but it's a better guess than, I guess, you know, nothing. Due to the high numbers of Varangians who were willing to enter Imperial service, there were actually a number of different Varangian unit types. The most famous were the Varangians of the city, and if you've ever heard of the Varangian Guard, then that's probably the unit that people are referring to, even though technically there are other Varangian units available. But the Varangians of the city are the Emperor's bodyguards. They're an elite unit in the field which accompany the Emperor and usually fight by his side. Unlike a lot of other units, unlike any other unit in the Byzantine army that I'm aware of, they actually purchase their positions. So these would be adventurers who are basically making an investment in themselves by purchasing a slot in the Emperor's Varangian Guard. Um, and this is a unit which in some form or fashion continued the function all the way until the Empire fell in 1453. Even though the Empire, of course, had passed its peak centuries before that. As for the other Varangian units, most likely these guys were very much comparable to the other underpaid mercenary units in Byzantine service who composed the majority of their army at various points in their history. And it's possible that after 1071, when the Byzantines were heavily defeated at Manzikert, that there were no more of these Varangian units of the field. However, again, the nature of the evidence is not strong enough that we can say this for certain. And the Varangians, especially the Varangians of the city, do play a leading role in many wars, battles, and palace coups. And that's usually when we get our information about them and the various historians who wrote about the history of Byzantium. It's only when they appear in a special role that they really get a lot of recognition. Usually if the Varangians are present but they don't do anything extraordinary, their presence will most likely just go unmentioned. When the emperor was at home in Constantinople and not actively conducting a campaign, his Varangian guardsmen would attend to other duties aside from fighting on the battlefield. Now, one of the major things that they would do is handle very unpleasant and very um, controversial matters. And nothing was more controversial than blinding or castrating a defeated noble. Now, by this period, they were starting to develop notions of what was humane and not humane and a lot of the Byzantines had come to the conclusion that when dealing with other nobles it was far preferable to disable the person than to kill them. That killing a person was unnecessary barbarism if you could simply remove them as a threat uh, through some other means. And for the most part the Varangians seem to be the guys who were called upon to perform blindings and castrations for defeated nobles. When defeated noble women were brought to the emperor, he instead, rather than mutilating them, which was considered to be barbaric if you do it to a woman, he would have their heads shorn and then he would send them off to convents to serve as nuns. And the idea is that if they have to take religious vows, then they renounce their worldly ambitions. And in a world where religion was taken very seriously as it was in Byzantium, this was seen as an honorable alternative to killing someone because you are still looking after their spiritual well-being and they're still better off than they would be if they were simply killed. Now another unpleasant task that the Varangians were often called upon to help out with is in tax collection. So tax collectors back then tended to face um, opposition if they didn't come in force. So many times Varangian guardsmen would accompany tax collectors door to door to make sure that the emperor got his money. And obviously if you're a Varangian you live off of tax money from the emperor. You have a lot of vested interest in making sure that that tax revenue is collected. When prisoners of war and spies were taken, uh, the Varangians were the guys who were entrusted with performing torture in order to gather information. There were not the um, sort of prejudices against torture that we have today in the medieval world. And regardless of whether torture was effective or not, that was a means by which medieval people tended to gather information. And the Byzantines 
in particular were very fond of employing torture to that end. The Varangians could also be used as escorts for officials and bishops if they were traveling through dangerous, poorly policed regions. And for the most part, that would be anywhere inside of the Byzantine Empire that was outside of Constantinople. It could also be for um, little journeys through enemy territory. So one scholar thinks that Harold Hardrada's trip to Jerusalem was not a military expedition as his saga claims, but rather he and a small body of men accompanying a bishop to get to a temple at Jerusalem. Now also, um, the Varangians tended to try to balance out this brutality that they showed in the field with some sense of honor. And you might be thinking, what honor could they possibly have if these guys commit torture and they are responsible for blinding and castrating people? Well, they have a very odd sense of honor, and I'm going to give you an anecdote which helps to illustrate sort of how that worked. Despite the fact that the Varangians were hired for their brutality and their willingness to do almost anything on behalf of the emperor, the Varangians still had some sense of honor, even if it is much different than what we today would normally think of as honor. To give one example, in the Chronicle of John Skylitsas, there is an instance when a Varangian soldier attempted to rape a woman, and when he let his guard down, she seized his spear and killed him. Now, rather than retaliating by murdering the woman, his comrades in arms actually refused to bury the man for engaging in unjust conduct, and they also were mostly angry at him for being slain by a woman. Now, it was their custom that if two people were in a personal argument and one managed to kill the other, that the victorious party would receive all the possessions of the defeated party. So accordingly, they went back and got all of this man's wealth and possessions, and as a group, they presented them to the woman who had murdered him. This is sort of something that doesn't really make a lot of sense to a modern person. However, it does give you a sense of what the Varangians would have thought of as being honorable. And it also gives you sort of a window into what they saw as a moral action at the time. Now let's look at the role that the Varangians played in the course of Byzantine history. The most important ruler in terms of his interactions with the Varangians is without a doubt Basil II the Bulgar Slayer. He ruled for almost 50 years from 976 to 1025 and he is considered to be either the best or close to the best Byzantine emperor and he's also one of the greatest generals of the medieval world. Now, it's very likely that he was the person who actually established the Varangian Guard, but if not, then it was one of his immediate predecessors, because this is the first time that we see the unit attested as early on in Basil's career. He had an extremely good relationship with the Varangians he hired. He offered very generous pay and rewards to the men who were willing to take up arms for him. And He's known as a great general, and he achieved many battlefield victories in both Europe and Asia. And in almost all of these vic battlefield victories that we have evidence for, the Varangian Guard played a central role in nearly all of them. Now, he also is the first person to set the precedent for Varangians to operate in other theaters. Remember, the Varangians of the field. And that way, you could have these elite soldiers fighting on the Emperor's behalf on fronts where he himself was not able to be present. One important example is that the Byzantines held territory in Italy and Sicily even during the early 11th century, and we know that Basil II never went there. However, we do know that some of his Varangian troops were present and fighting in Italy during his reign. Most Varangian guardsmen never achieved fame. However, Harold Hardrada did. He later, of course, became a king in his own right. Now, early in his life, he was exiled from Norway after his own brother, St. Olaf, was murdered. And then he traveled for the next 15 years in the east where he served as a mercenary in both Kiev and Byzantium. His deeds are recorded in Snorri 
Sterluson's Epic from the 13th century. If you're interested, I recommend checking that out. And during this epic, his deeds and rank as a Varangian are talked about by the author. However, we very much think that his role was massively exaggerated during the epic, as things tend to be in epics. Um, in reality, he was probably only sort of a mid-ranking officer, and he would not have really been known to the Emperor personally, because the Emperor had many Varangians working for him, and a lot of them would have been a lot more important than Harold, who was still a comparatively young man, and someone who hadn't really made a name for himself yet. But anyway, he probably gave good service and made a decent chunk of change. Later on, he returned to Norway in 1046 and reclaimed the throne. He tried to conquer Denmark. And at some point during his reign in Norway, he made an alliance with Byzantium and made use of his status as a former Varangian in order to establish contact with the Byzantine court. And it's probable that the leadership experience that he had in the Varangian Guard was what enabled him to retake Norway and to become a competent general in Europe. Now, he actually died during the events of 1066. There were two invasions that year. Harold Hardrada led the first one in sort of central England, and he was defeated by the Anglo-Saxons at Stamford Bridge where he died. Later, of course, William the Bastard won at Hastings and became William the Conqueror, which, of course, created Anglo-Saxon exiles, who many of whom ended up in the Varangian Guard, as we alluded to earlier. Harold Hardrada is considered to be the last true Viking and the last Viking king, and his career would not have been possible if he hadn't had the career opportunity that he had in the Varangian Guard. Byzantium had a very long history, and as you might expect, they had lots of up and downs over the course of that history. Um, in 1071, they fought the battle at Manzikert, and among the other units which were wrecked in the battle, the Varangian Guard was slain almost to a man, defending the defeated emperor Diogenes IV. Now, soon thereafter, Alexius I Comnenus took power, and he immediately started rebuilding the Varangian Guard and restoring it to glory. Because of his heavy use of Varangian troops, Alexius I is by far the most popular Byzantine emperor in Icelandic tales. His name is mentioned quite a bit, even in periods where he was clearly already dead or where he's been retconned into events that occurred before he was even born. Now, during the 11th century, there was an influx of Englishmen fleeing from Norman England that would have happened in the years immediately around the Battle of Manzikert, so that meant that there were plenty of people to recruit from for Alexius's new Varangian Guard. And since, uh, you know, all the Norsemen had been killed at Manzikert, this meant that Alexius could recruit Englishmen and Scotsmen en masse and reconstitute the Guard. And since their ways of fighting were so similar, the Anglo-Saxons also tended to use axes and things of that nature, it wasn't a major change. Also, if you think about it, the Anglo-Saxon refugees couldn't flee around the Viking world the same way that the Varangians could. So remember Harold Hardrada, he had other options. If you're an Anglo-Saxon who just lost his homeland to the Normans, you don't really have any other options. So you have to stay there and you have to be more loyal than a Viking would be. Now, um, the Crusades era for Byzantium lasted from 1081 until 1204. 1081 is the year that Alexius I succeeded to the throne. The Crusades start in 1095, and the Crusading era for the Byzantines ended in 1204 when they were actually at the receiving end of a Western Crusade and the Fourth Crusade. Now, during the First Crusade, many Western Europeans came to Byzantium on the way to Jerusalem, and some of them decided to sign up with the Byzantines and abandon the Crusade. Um, some of the follow-up operations which occurred after that, both the Second and Third Crusade, and then some events that happened in between, also helped bring potential Varangian guardsmen to the Empire. Now, during the Fourth Crusade, 
the Venetians raised more or less a mostly French army and they were trying to fund this attack on, uh, you know, another attack on the Middle East. However, in the meantime, they got involved in a Byzantine succession dispute and when they didn't get paid, they laid siege to the city. Most of the Byzantine army was off defending the frontier, so the Varangian Guard was really the only professional unit around. And during that uh, war, the Varangian Guard was the only effective unit. But to their discredit, one of the few real stains on the reputation, after the Crusaders pierced the walls of Constantinople, the Varangian Guard refused to keep fighting and simply surrendered to the victorious Crusaders. After the fall of Constantinople in 1204, we don't really have a lot of evidence of the Varangian Guard for the remaining 250 or so years of Byzantine history. However, we do know a little bit. Now, the Latin Empire, which was the empire ruled by basically the Crusaders from the Fourth Crusade, lasted from 1204 to 1261, and most likely they did not employ a Varangian Guard. We do know that Nicaea, one of the major successor states to the Byzantines, and which was ruled by a Byzantine noble family, did use the Varangian Guard because, as we'll talk about in a minute, Michael Paleologus had a Varangian unit. There's also a possibility that the Empire of the Trebizond might have employed something like a Varangian Guard, but again, our evidence on the Empire of the Trebizond is so fragmentary that it's impossible to really say. Now this late Varangian Guard was almost entirely English and Scottish, um, so it had changed its nature. And I'm not exactly sure during this later period why there were so many Englishmen and Scotsmen willing to go east and fight for the Emperor, but I assume at this point it might have had something to do with crusading zeal that was tempered by the desire to make money. Now, um, Michael VIII Paleologus, he is the guy who was the head of the Nicene Empire, and he also recaptured Constantinople in 1261, thus ending the Latin Empire and officially restoring Byzantium as a place ruled by a Greek dynasty. Now, the last definite mention of the Varangian Guard is all the way in 1330, when there's an imperial coronation for a child emperor and the Varangian Guard is mentioned as being there and taking the oath of loyalty to this child. There is the possibility, it's a bit romantic, but um, there is the possibility that a lot of people want to believe and that is that the Varangian Guard went down fighting against the Ottomans when Mehmed II conquered the city in 1453. However, our knowledge of all of these things is pretty sketchy and it is really just a matter of guesswork for this later period, which is why I chose not to focus on it in this video. If you have any further interest in the topic of the Varangian Guard in particular or in the Byzantine military more broadly, then I highly recommend checking out the following sources. Some of them are survey texts, which will give you a general overview of Byzantine history. Some are primary sources where you can actually see the Varangian Guard referenced in a larger context. And one of these, Sigfus Blondel's book, is actually a concentrated study of the Varangian Guard, albeit one which is painful to read because it's poorly organized and poorly written, but a lot of stuff is there. So, until next time, I'm Thersites the Historian.